Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. We're actually going to start on time, which is almost unheard of. Um, thank you very much for coming, all of you. Um, Professor Baron Towil has been one of the leading international scholars on Siam, Thailand, Dai, Thai, Ahom, whatever, over the past generation. He has an extraordinary record of books, of articles, of lectures, of teaching, and everything else. His main career was in the University of Hamburg, from where he retired a few years ago. And like uh, several who uh, retire in this way, he's been even busier since retiring. He has also discovered, I think to his dismay, that he missed his real vocation in life. He should not have been an academic. He should have been a detective. <laughs> he came a couple of years ago and gave us a wonderful detective account of about the wonderful cosmology that the Draipun manuscripts from the Daxin era, era. This time he has come back with both a revelation and uh, a detective story. Uh, a couple of us last year were privileged to see the first glimpse of this uh, extraordinary couple of documents which he is going to show us tonight. And I think we both just the jaw dropped to see that this extraordinary graphical document from, from 300 years ago has still existed in this wonderful condition. So I, leave, I will leave it at that. Uh, please welcome Bas, Professor Baran Tawil. Thank you. Dear Chris, thank you for your kind introductory words. I, I'm always afraid I cannot uh, fulfill all those lovely um, expectations that Chris raises, but I'll do my best. <clears throat> I'll, straight away, I'll straight away move with um, trying out this machine that I have here in my hand. Yes, it works. It was just about one year ago that I got an email uh, contact from a museum in Dresden asking me for my opinion on two scrolls that they have discovered. Um, the museum in Dresden is um, making a catalogue of chinoiserie, of Chinese art objects made for the European market. And there is a big collection of um, objects that were made for, for, the, for the European market that was collected by August um, the Strong, King of Saxony and King of Poland and of Lithuania as well. Um, very wealthy man and he sent his agents around uh, Europe to collect whatever they knew he liked. The, the many, many of those treasures were kept during the Second World War in, in, in places where no bombs could destroy them and luckily they survived. Much of his treasures survived. The buildings had to be partly rebuilt and now they're filling up those newly rebuilt buildings with the collections. And so they're looking at this collection of chinoiserie and they found a container this high, round, and they opened it and they found there was rolled up three, two scrolls and a document. This is the, what I call the black and white scroll. And you can see the length 3 meters 70 and the height 50 centimeters. That means what you are going to see there is a document that is maybe a bit longer than that. It was rolled out for me on a table uh, when I 
because the first thing I did after I saw the email is I took a train ticket to Dresden because uh, I, what I saw was, was a stunning thing. This was the first thing. The second scroll is an amazing scroll, is a colored version, shorter, and um, you can see the right part looks a little bit attached, as if, as if part of it has been detached and the right part has been put on again. Um, if I go back, you see it's similar, but it is also very dissimilar. And so what I did is uh, I looked at it and I looked at the document that was with it. Um, first thing I noticed is that on this black and white scroll there are 16 or 15 or 16 items that are written out underneath or above the objects that are shown. And you'll see that uh, there is, for example, an, a mythical animal and there's written in European script what sort of an animal it is. So you see here a rhinoceros, a rhinoc a rhinoceros is written down. And here you see a, a lion and there's an, another type of lion. Often it is written in Thai as a European writes it. Interesting enough, for the eagle, they write in Thai. Well, that is how you write it in Thai. But the modern, modern Thais pronounce it in Si. But I have the feeling, and you'll see some reason why, that in Thai was pronounced in Thai in the time that these documents were made. Now, we'll see parts of it in detail later. Here is the document, the beginning of the document, that was with it. And that really um, was a very interesting clue. I have translated the title. Annotation concerning the place where the king of Siam, so there I was, I was in Siam, who was cremated, uh, was cremated, who had assumed the name of, and I've made it in blue, so that you, so that, so that you will notice it. Pra Trong Tan. Look at the peculiar ending of the word. That means God of wisdom. Well, he is a Dutchman, he doesn't understand Thai very much often. It doesn't mean God of wisdom. But, but Pra is something high, and Song Tam in modern Thai uh, means devout. Devout. And then I added that, who died on February 5th and cremated on the 26th of December in the year 1704. Now, that really is exciting. There was a king who did die on February the 5th of the year before. So in 1703, a king of Thailand died, and that was King Petracha. And so I was straight away pretty sure that the document that the pictures we have seen have something to do with the cremation of King Petracha. The text itself is, this is the first page, it's only the first bit of the first page. It's a long text, it's three pages long, um, and it, it says the letter A is a high pyramid and so on and so on. Letter B is another, the letter C is a door leading to the place where the corpse will be burnt and so on. So it is, a, it is an indication of what is on the scrolls. Because on the, on the colored scroll, all these letters can be found, every one of them, and symbols and numbers, and they're all listed in this document. There's a lot of work gone into it. So this text was worked at by somebody, it's all in the Dutch language, who is in Siam 
and who wrote in the Dutch language the explanation of the scrolls. Now we are already pretty far. I could deduct all that in the museum when I saw it for the first time. So the people in the museum were pretty impressed. You know, I could read all Dutch. And I knew who it must have been King Petracha. And the difficulty was that this 1704, that is old Dutch. A modern Dutchman would say 1709. And 1709 also Thai King died. And so they all thought it was King Sir, but it wasn't. It wasn't. That's an old, that's a four in his handwriting. Because you can see it later, in his text he says number four, and that's that four. So, pretty sure. Now, I did a year's long work, and it isn't finished yet. I, I've still, I did this this morning. This morning I, I made this picture for you. Because I'm putting together all kinds of information that, that I get out of, out of the literature in order to better understand what was going on, what was my problem is, why two scrolls? One in detail very Thai and the other a little bit colored and, and wild. Why two scrolls? And I found out that I could find out who it was for whom the scrolls were made. There is namely in in Amsterdam, no, in The Hague. In The Hague, there is a document, and two persons in this audience have seen and worked with this document. There is a document calling account of what happened by the illness and death of the Siamese king called Pra Trong Tan. And that is a letter from Arnold Kleur. And it was written after the death of King uh, Petra Cha. So there, I think, we don't need to fight very much about it. We know it was Arnold Kleur who was interested in it. His account is 12 pages long. It's a long account, and the two historians who have worked with it have given the, 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 the details it says about the, the political turmoil that was going on in the in the country, the killings, how the new king had killed a, a, a pretender to the throne, actually who had a good right on the throne, and how um, this killing was planned in great detail. He, he enticed the future, uh, the, the, the pretender, to ride his horse, and the pretender was only a young boy, he couldn't ride very well, but he said, you can ride very well, very well. And then he tricked him into going into an area where he could be clubbed to death. It was a very dramatic story. And then he tells about how his mother reacted and how everybody who was connected with his man was, was killed in a most dramatic and awful way. Hooks through the breast will hang up and then they died on the, on, uh, in that way and were eaten up by birds and the most gruesome things. I came to the conclusion a few days ago that nothing of it was true. <laughs> nothing. But that is Kleur. Kleur thought, yeah, I'm here, just become the chief of the Dutch office the Dutch trading office in Ayutthaya. He sits there to make money for the Dutch organization. And he's, he's, buy, he's supervising the buying of goods and selling them on to Japan. That's where most of the money was made. And he's just become the chief. And there he gets the lovely situation that he hears in the court, and that is about two kilometers away, in the court there has been killings. The king has died. And a young prince has been dying, and there's people dying. And he, in his office, writes all this down, as he thinks might have happened. As far as I know, and as far as the Thai annals go, it didn't happen that way. It, none of the details happened. And what he writes in it, actually, cannot, he cannot have happened. And uh, that will be part of an article that probably I'll be able to get at the Siam Society. Not in a not too far future. Now we're going to look at some of the details. I'm saving the most beautiful bits for later. 
this is the, the colored version. And this is the colored version that has all these A's, B's, C's, uh, up to the end of the alphabet, and then the one, two, three, and so on. And you see, this is a funeral procession. Here is the urn of the king being pulled by horses and uh, somebody riding on the horse with a, with a red heel halo. And here we see eight mythical animals on sledges, each with three coaches carrying uh, formal umbrellas. These are firework towers, and these are small uh, places to make theater. This is to entertain the public that goes on for seven days and seven nights when the king is being cremated. These, cremation, um, these cremations of kings was an event you can hardly imagine what sort of an event it was. It wasn't as simple as this. The cart was pulled by more than a thousand people probably. Behind it were another 200 to break it if it goes out of control. There were soldiers, there were wailing women, there were, there were hundreds of coaches, there were hundreds of Buddhist priests, there were all kinds of things going on. Seven days, seven nights. And the, this movement f from the, with about 50 animals, 50 mythical animals on sledges being pulled towards a magical tower that they have built, a tower of immense proportion. We'll, we will see one in a minute. Um, in a, set in a court, yard surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight smaller towers. That was number B, smaller tower, sm a smaller pyramid he calls it. Here's the, here's the central one, here's a smaller one. So this is number A in his list. Um, a golden tower and there's the door, the doorway, number C. If you look with a, with a magnifying glass, you'll see the small number C. So here we get familiar with what Kleur's colored version is. The differences with the non-colored version will become more apparent now. <clears throat> the words in red indicates items that we not found in the colored one. So this is there. There is a Mount Meru, a little different from the Dutch, as you imagine. It looks a bit different, but it is inspired by it. There's no doubt about it. There's both a central pyramid. Um, here's a forecourt. That is a, a new item that we haven't seen. <coughs> the number of uh, mythical animals is one more, but they are only being pulled by two coaches. My opening picture is two of those coaches pulling. You know, the, the one that you've been looking at when you were breathlessly waiting for this talk. Um, so the sets of two. The, 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 the houses look where the Buddhist monks are sitting. Oh, no, this is where the theater performances are being made. Look quite different from the ones that I had. There are three chariots here which are not in the colored scroll. But they have, in the colored scroll, uh, we'll see uh, also a different way in which the urn is being, the, the dead king is being pulled. And we'll see that there is a kneeling person raising his hands towards the, the urn in which the body of the king has been waiting for 22 months to be cremated in the tower. So this is the, the, the scroll that I found most impressive because the style is different, the details conform to my mind much more with Thai culture than the other one does. So in a way the chinoiserie is the colored version.
This is not a chinoiserie. This is, a, this is something made by a Thai. The other one, I don't think it's being made, made by a Thai. I, I compare for you a few items. Here you see, you see the formal umbrellas, a detail from the edge of the mountain in the Thai, in the Thai version. And here you see how the Dutchman, or some foreigner in the, in, in the place where it came, how he changed, but he was still, still was very much influenced. It's a copy, but it's not a real copy. If you, if you look at the number of layers in the umbrella, you'll see that often it's an even number in the Dutch one. It's never an even number in the Thai one. The Thais do not make a formal umbrella in even numbers. It's a three umbrella, it's a five umbrella, it's a seven umbrella, depending on what our object is being honored. This is the highest honor you can give an object. This Mount Meru is a special thing. It's taken months to build. The open, open air stage for theater, this is the colored version. Not even the roof, I'd say, that's not a Thai roof. That is a roof, well, it, it bends, but like the Thais have, a, have, a, have, a, have, an, have an item that goes up, but that is a different one from the air. Um, I have a better uh, picture at the next one for this object. These are Buddhist monks' uh, dwellings. Oh no, the, here they are. Um, this is in the, oops, back again. What's happening here? Here. Ah. You see that here is a kind of a formal seat in a sala, so it is protected from rain. Here is a formal seat drawn in perspective as it was drawn in the 17th century in Thailand. That's Thai perspective. So you can see it is a seat and it has depth to the side. Here say we the front one. This is the, the version in color. Here see a, a chair like we have chairs in Holland. This one, well, it's inspired, but this is a Thai roof. This is not a Thai roof. This is a kind of spiky, spiky thing. It's not Thai. So I'd say the indigenous roll, scroll, was the inspiration for the foreign one. And so I've got the order of scrolls fixed in my mind. If you not, don't agree with it, and if you think that was the first one, and that was made out of it, then I would like to know your arguments. I, I, I'm personally on firm ground, as far as I know. You can read the text there. Here I've got a rare picture that was only published in 2015 by someone who is sitting here in the room. Um, this was the Meru, the tower, in which the, king, the second king of Thailand was burnt in 1866. It's one of the earliest photographs made in Bangkok, and it is a treasure that shows us the, the smaller towels, it shows us the wall, and it shows us the central tower. It's a gigantic building. And they used, if you look in the Thai annals, in the 17th century, three times they tell how high this thing was. And at one time, it was 100 meters high. I mean, can you imagine? It was higher than any building in the whole of the, of the city. I think that was, the, that was the thing that was intended. Because it was intended to send the dead king up on top of Mount Meru, out of our world, right into the heavens. And so you need to have something bigger than, a, than, a, uh, than the, 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 the highest towers that, that ordinary humans make. It was a magical, a magic, a magical thing that will, that will send the king to heaven. There you find the same thing. 
These are the, the four corners. The four corners at that time, in, in, in 1704, was still part of the, the complex. Here, these four are on the four corners of the, um, where north is, south, and west is. So you should see it. But the, the fact is that at that time, they couldn't give the perspective to show that. In each of those towers, there's a Buddhist monk chanting. You must see him sitting there, chanting texts. When this happens, the sacred moment of burning the king. Um, compare that with the with the coloured version, and I would say of the three, here. Sorry, of those three, there is something interesting extra to to see, what has to do with the style uh, uh, of the of the document. This is what, or something like is, what the artist had in mind. This is something stylized. It is the contours, the contours, the outer, the outer edges of a very complex thing. And so it, it gives us an idea of what it is, but it is not like a photograph. This is rounded. Here we find a central thing and here we find four towers, but the person who made it didn't realize it is at the four corners of the, uh, the directions of the wind. But you can see it's too, it was inspired of one another. Here's a, an entrance. Here's also an entrance. Um, we'll see some more details in a minute. Um, here is a major difference. This is a funeral card as funeral cards are. They're still in the National uh, Museum, in the National Museum in Bangkok. You'll find maybe the same, a very similar card. It's a huge thing. It is from where I stand right up till the end of this room. And it takes a marvelous amount of power in order to get it going on four wheels. This is a chariot. It's not a funeral cart. So the person who made this scroll was going for a, the beauty of Thai chariots. And you find Thai chariots everywhere. On every mural you'll find a Thai chariot, whether it is the sun or the moon going through the universe, or the, whether it is Prince Siddhartha who is going out uh, in the town. You'll find everywhere, you'll find it in the Vesantara Jataka, you'll find this chariot, always on a big wheel, always being pulled by animals and uh, having a, a person riding it. There's no, no person on it who is who is uh, venerating the urn. The urn itself, very beautifully done. So he took, he took trouble, but he was not interested in Thai culture. He was interested in, in beauty of some sort, but he did not know the, the, the details of the, of the Thai culture. Here you see a chariot out of a out of a Thai artistic document, 1780 about, 1780 a bit later, but there are earlier ones, and you can see the, the details fit, the way it is hung up, the way the, the little flames and, uh, are given, um, also the waving of, the, of the, the flags and things, and the top, very similar, and you see the the, the, here's a three-layer, three-layer chats, um, formal umbrellas as well. Now, this is what I actually I hope you're going to enjoy most. That is the detailed look on the what I call black and white scroll. So now we're going to really look at it. And I blow up, as far as I could, the details. So now we're going through the scroll as it is bigger than it is in reality, so you have an advantage. I mean, if, you, if I was with you in the museum, you wouldn't see it as well as this. You would all be crowding each other over your shoulders and you wouldn't see it. This is really the best way of looking at it. 
And we are going, we're beginning by the Meru, by the tower where the king will be burnt, and we'll end up with the end of the procession. So I hope you, you'll enjoy this. This is the first time in 300 years that Thai people have a chance to look at this document. It has been sitting in, a, in an air, airtight container for 300 years and nobody has ever looked at it, as far as I know. And so that is a, something uh, of, of, of great interest to you, I think. So we begin at the left. Here's a piece of the document has, has broken off. Don't forget, it has been rolled up and out uh, when on its way from Ayutthaya to Holland and from Holland to Dresden. I, I followed that track. It took me a lot of time. I, I searched in the archives of Dresden and I found out that the king of, of, of Saxony has written a receipt for two Chinese scrolls in 1716, exactly 300 years ago. And he got them from, a, from the director of the Dutch East Indian Company in Amsterdam. And Kleur worked for the Dutch East Indian Company. So, and there is a way that I, that I can reconstruct and which I will do in the future, in which, how that happened. Because Kleur died in 1612. So this is older than 1612. Um, so, I've always written on the left some items to guide your attention, but probably you'll see things that I haven't seen. So, please beware and, and help me when you, when, when I, when you see things that I have missed in my talk and you say, hey, you know, that wasn't two or it wasn't three or it wasn't that, or I have identified an, a building wrong. So here we see the most, the central tower and most of the outer towers. We see a, a series of, of um, cages. These are all cages. These are the cages for the mythical animals. There are 60, maybe 70 of these animals. They are made out of bamboo and they are covered with paper. They are made on the occasion for this ceremony. They spent a lot of time doing it. These mythical animals, there are handbooks of them, uh, usually about 60 of them. Um, we'll see them in detail a few. They were, they're all being brought in in the procession and they are housed in these cages. This is the beginning of the part of the universe where it's no longer human because he's going to, into the sacred mountain to heaven. That's why there is another, another covering. This is the, the fence between the sacred world and the profane world. This is, in here it's sacred. So the, what is happening here is something very special. There are some, some mythical statues. That is a yaksha with a big club. And here are two kinaris. They are half, half bird, half woman. They are also half man, half bird. This is the kinon. Here you see parts that you've already seen. This is the front of the cages. They've turned them around and they've put them on the side. They, you see, the, the perspective is different, but this is the same. It is as if you're looking from the inside, also here from the inside. It takes a different way of looking at it. We are here in the 17th century. They are not used to European um, uh, ways of, of, um, of showing uh, three-dimensional like we do. For the people at that time, it was quite clear that this is the inside, because that's the inside, and here is the inside turned 90 degrees. We're moving now a little bit. It's still the same thing, but we have moved a little bit, so I'm, I'm pulling this, I'm rolling the scroll for you. And we are rolling now towards the beginning, which I call the forecourt, still with its own sacred 
thing. Here are the first of 16 towers, and the, from these towers, there were there was firework towers. This is a typical firework tower. And the interesting thing in the Thai annals, they say for the funeral of Petra Acha, there are several accounts, and one of them says there are lots of wailing women and so on and so on, and it says there were 16 firework towers. There are 16 in this document. I've just discovered it by accident, and I must say, my heart starts pounding when I see it. This is the end of, this is the end of thing. Here you see the second, uh, uh, the, the, the difference between profane and, and sacred. And here are two unusual figures. When I showed it to one of my colleagues, I said, well, I know what that one is. He's a judge because of his clothes. And he's pointing like a judge points in old manuscripts. There are some examples. And then this colleague of mine said to me, that must be the judge's helper. Because in Thai law, and he knows more than I do, there is this, this judge who is deciding over heaven or hell. He has to have so many decisions to make. He needs help, and that's his helper. Here I give you Chitra Gupta in, 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 in Sanskrit. Um, I'm just blowing up the details for you, just to see what, what the artist has done. This is the person in contour. So you see the contours, with here and there a little, a little detail. And look at the way that the surety of his pen has stunned me. He, he, there is not. I haven't discovered places where he has blackened it out and did something better. He has a, he has a hand that just, that just once touched the paper. It's, it's 10 pieces of paper that are glued onto a piece of linen. And I am pretty sure they were glued onto that linen by that artist. Because you never see where one ends and the other goes on. It's a very fine linen. It's a different linen than the colored one. It's a different paper than the colored one. The colored one is thick paper, thick linen. This is a fine linen, fine paper. I, my, my feeling goes that the paper and the linen were in the court of Ayutthaya. And I, my feeling is that the thick colored one the thick, big pieces of paper came from the, from the Dutch trading office just outside the city. Um, I've, I, I, I pointed out, so he, I think he first, he first finished this figure and he put him later behind. I think that's the, that's the way he worked. It's one of the few occasions that we see the sequence of what he did. So the, first, most, the more important figure was finished with his hand and everything. And this was, the, the, the dress was put later in. If you don't agree with me, let make a note in your mind. And here we, we are going back to the scroll. So I'm rolling up a little bit further. And we see the first animal, and here it is called But I, I, I have it on my computer, you see it, but anyway. So two men, or the eagle, this is the in sea. In three is, is written in Dutch writing. You can see, what is interesting is that this is being written with great care. It's not a, a rough thing, so I think the Dutchman, has Dutch writing, there are lots of Dutch words coming. The, he received this piece and he was explained things by a Thai, I would imagine by the, by the artist or the servant who brought it. And he says, this is an entry, and that is what the Dutchman wrote down. Here we see the first of, of, the, of the acrobats, that we will see more. 
here I think is a is a uh, a wishing tree I think it is it is one of those mythical things in in heaven where you can wish to have something you can pluck from it I think it's a wishing tree They're all males, these bears. Eh? I see no females, but uh, if you see a female, warn me. Here we find a rhinoceros. This is written in Dutch, and also very carefully written in the middle. So I think when he received the, the, the scroll, it was f for his purpose. He, he wrote it carefully in because it was his, the Dutch scroll by now. It was made for a Dutchman. And my, my hypothesis is it was made for Kleur because Kleur had already written about the death of the king. Now he can write about the funeral of the king. And I'm pretty sure he attended. And when you attend a thing like that and you see crowds and crowds of people and thousands of people, how are you going to deal with it if you don't speak Thai? So he went to someone and said, could you draw the essentials? And the essentials were drawn. That's my hypothesis. And here we see all the ones who are pulling are not pulling the same. So he is pulling this way. The shoulder is different from that shoulder. The face is individual. And uh, these animals all have a, a container. So I said, these are sledges. And it's, it weighs nothing. It's bamboo and paper and they are about this high, and they have a container on the back, and one container carries the fire. And in fact, the rhinoceros is the one who carries the fire which will burn the king. So there is a, a little fire in it. Others carry wood, special scented wood for, for feeding the fire. Others carry beetle nuts and so on. We'll see some. We'll see that the scenes Underneath, uh, sorry, we're going to the scenes underneath the acrobats um, and the fireworks. These are these are more of the 16 fireworks. They show seven days of entertainment. Here are plays being given, and here is fireworks being given. Here are entertainment. This is the entertainment section of the scroll. It is summarizing something. Seven days, seven nights, things happening. Here on top are the wishing trees, and I think these are monks' uh, dwellings. There are hundreds of monks. They all receive um, the cloth to dress themselves. It's a typical thing to make merit for the, for the deceased person. It happens in every major Thai funeral up to the day of the day. The, 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 myth, myth, the mythical animals, they go through the, these are the real mythical animals as they were drawn in, in handbooks that you can now find in the National Library. I'll show you an example later. They're exactly how they are. That is, and they all have a different name. Some of them are in Sanskrit, some of them are in Dutch, translated. And, um, oh yeah, I've got one here, the Kileen. This is the key lane. It's written down. Oh, no, this is key lane. And here we find a. I can't read it from here. We are moving on. Sledges with the Chinese lion, the royal lion, and to the right hand, the Kotsi, the lion with an elephant's trunk. All these animals are mixed animals. These are the animals that live in the in the foothills of the, of, of the central mountain. Uh, the animals that we don't see because we can't travel that far, but this is, being, uh, this is a cosmic event that is being enacted. And, uh, and that's why, why they are there and why these things are being pulled. The, here are huge buildings, I think again for Buddhist monks, there are more of these wishing trees, and they're individually different. Not so on the Dutch, uh, on the colored scroll. 
Here we come to the, the, the Kochasi. And here is a Kinon. We, have, we already saw Kinaris in the Meru. This is the male version. This is a, a man with a, with a bird's bottom part of his body. So it's the male version. And also he carries something. And here we find the, the difference between the sacred and the profane is being re-begun because we are coming close to the king's corpse, which is important, of course. And here is the first of the big carriages that is coming. So the lettuce fence here, the Rajavat, uh, is full of these uh, chats, these umbrellas. That is how a Rajavat should look like. It is, it is well uh, known in Thai ritual. And look at these cards. So th these, are, these are actually the chariot cards. And I am pretty sure that in these are sitting, um, this one is the seat of the Sankarat, because it's written on it, it's written on it, the bishop's carriage. So behind curtains sits the Sankarat, and, and there should be a connection between the Sankarat and the king's corpse. But the artist has left it out. But I'm 100% sure that there should be a, a, a strong cloth that connects the two. He is, this is the Sankarat, the head of the Buddhist church, is praying, is saying sacred words while the king's corpse is being moved right up to the mirror. So I, I put thing, uh, interesting things for you to read at the side so you don't have to listen to me. You can just read it for yourself. So we, we are almost there. Here we come to the, the third vehicle. Behind the curtains that it says it's the king's son. Which must be, as far as I know, King Sir. King Sir is a, a Sorasak who uh, reached the throne 22 months earlier in a rather drastic way by killing his contenders. Uh, look at the perspective there. Um, here is the king's carriage, and actually I found a, a miniature version of the king's carriage, which, uh, which was sent to Philadelphia at the very first world uh, uh, exhibition in America. And King Chulalongkorn had this little miniature carriage made, and it is now in the Smithsonian in, in, in New York. And so I made a copy of it to, sh to see how well our artist managed to give us the impression of what it looks like. Here you see the, the four wheels, you see the, the structure. Um, it's being pulled on the, in this artistic version by mythical animals. Um, here is, I, this looks to me, maybe this is king, uh, the king's son. It, he must be pretty well connected to the previous one. He must have play a special role. So, whether uh, the person who wrote the word the king's son on the previous picture underneath made a mistake, I don't know. Because that looks to me as the best candidate for it. But I'd like your opinion. It's the first time that ties can, can help me in this. So I think that might be it. This, this is a beautiful urn. And here, the, this is the charioteer. That's the last of the salas. Also very strange perspective. And behind, behind the end, this is the end of the scroll. While the, the, the colored version has nothing behind, or, or maybe two coaches, here is a lot behind. There are still more sledges, 
with elephants, which are also part of the 56 or 67 or whatever, the big amount of the real profession. So this is the end of the scroll. Again, here are some coaches with different clothes a little bit, uh, but most of the crowns, we'll look at the faces in a minute, uh, seem to be all of the same rank. This has puzzled me, because here are uh, um, um, a mahout, and here is a, a protective second soldier. It's like a, a warring elephant with, with people on it. But whether it's puppets or not, I cannot decide, because, because it, is a, it is a sledge. It's not a real elephant. So my feeling is it's not real people. My feeling is it's just part of the artistic creation that we are looking at. But again, uh, if somebody has an idea. Here I've got, here I've got a, an old document in the National Library that, that has all of these animals. And you can see the technique is very similar to what we've seen. This is uh, from uh, another, uh, I forget where I got this one from. Oh, this is from, the, from our manuscript. So you can see, this is our manuscript. And there is written under it, Rhinoster. Rhinoster means rhinoceros. So this comes from our scroll that we've already seen. I'm, I'm showing this, this one because this one, it should, it shouldn't, it's not a rhinoceros. What it should be is a mixture between elephant and rhino. And it should have a trunk and a horn. It has a trunk and a horn. The Dutch version has only the horn, has no trunk. He's missed it out. He didn't know. He's not a, he's not a, a tie. I've, I'm giving you some details since I think you've, you've enjoyed the scroll as you've seen it. Now we're looking at some, uh, some of the uh, details so that we can, uh, we can do more. We, this is comparative interesting work, maybe. Um, look, that is the first two. And here are all the people pulling and walking in front. That face is quite different from that one. He doesn't look the same. I think all the faces, he just created people, not standard-wise, like in the colored one. The colored one, all the faces, from beginning to end, are the same. Once you've got a Thai face, they all look the same to a Dutchman at that time, if you're new. Here are the chariot faces. Here are the, the walking with the chariot. Here are the charioteers. Here I find some, uh, you know, how people have made faces at that time in 1776, the manuscript that I have talked about last time. Um, the way the mouths are made, I find are very similar. That is the Thai tradition, with a, with a nostril and lovely, the eyebrow going up, flying up a bit. That's, that's standard. With every eyebrow, it goes up. I'm, I've not looked at Thai faces that carefully, but I don't know where they get this flying eyebrow, eyebrows from. But it's, it is the, it's the, the tradition. It, it is a sign of that the document is genuinely 17th, uh, end of the 17th century, beginning of 18th century. Here we find, uh, I've got every human apart from all the, the artists, uh, the, the, the acrobats, I've got every human blown up uh, to show to a colleague in New York who wants to write an article on, on them. That's why I'm, I'm sharing it with you. He will be analyzing their dresses and style. Uh, he's an art historian of, of world renown who wants to be in and do something about it. So I call them puppets, but I, I'm not sure. You, you give me an opinion whether that is a puppet or not. That isn't the second one. I find the hands are intriguing. 
but I'm not that good in elephant lore and so on, uh, whether it's real or whether it's not real. It's a conundrum for me. Here I find your headdresses. Um, we've seen that one uh, with the uh, judge and his helper Chitra Gupta. We see this type of, this type of uh, headdress all the time. And this is not hair, eh? this is not hair. This is part of the dress. And you'll see that also when, you, when, we, when we go back. You see, you see this, this is not hair flying. That is part of the, the dress, as far as I know. Yeah. There's written on it, red elephant with betel nut, in Dutch. Uh, that's what they told Kleur when he received it. That's what he wrote, white elephant with water. So the containers carried that after the, after the king's corpse. Um, I told you that I think that between the Sankarat and the urn, there must be a connection. Here is a drawing made in 1690. This is from the diary of Engelbert Kempfer. He saw such a ceremony uh, from a distance, and he quickly sketched it to crowds and crowds and crowds of people. And you see the, this is the corpse. Here is the priest, and they're connected. So this walks the other way around. And this looks more like the towers that are being, I think he got something mixed up. But it is the only account I have from a European who from a distance sees a royal ceremony passing through Ayutthaya. The perspective I already talked to you about it, that they, that they have clicked, turned by almost 90 degrees the cages for the animals, that's an entry cage, entry, 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 entry. And here it is again, 18th century, early 18th century perspective. Here I've got the details so that you can see what they look like. These chairs, and this is also, I think, a formal chair. I'm not sure what they, that is a baldachin, that's quite clear. But. The use of chairs in, in 1704 for Buddhist monks, I'm not sure about it. It looks very European to me. So there are some puzzles. Um, here are the fire, the towers from which firework comes. This is a uh, 1930 reconstruction of, uh, of, of, a, of a mural. Um, but you can see what's going on. You know, here is an, a theater performance in between the firework towers and one of the artists, uh, one of the things. But the difference between murals and what is here is here is everything in, in contours. This is a real body. This is contours of a tower. This is a square tower. This has depth with real people. Um, I got from uh, my colleague uh, some pictures from Wat Pradu. Here you see, um, when they disc in murals, a crowd, one is behind the other. Here's three layers of them. One covers the other. But uh, here are all the hats from coaches. We only saw them with two of ours. The, the dresses are, are very similar. I, I call the, the black and white scroll that has rev riveted my attention most. I, I, I could go on with the Dutch one, but, but the black and white one, I, th I call it Siamese contour art. This was drawn by an artist, and very nicely. This was drawn by another artist. And you can see it's to, it is a teaching it, it tells what is what. And this also is a teaching thing to tell how to make the next one when the next 
royal funeral is, this is what it is, and those people should be connected with this one. So there are handbooks of how to, how to send the king off to heaven. And this is part of it. But what I was saying, the art is to presenting the essential outline in profile. That is an art in itself. And so you find a, a horse's hoof, it's not bad, but it's in, it's in outline only. And that is why I think is, if we're going to understand the, the big scroll that I've, I've pulled in front of your eyes, if we're going to understand that art, I think this is the, the, the clue with which we can appreciate it even more. Because now we understand why so much is not there. Never is there a place that overlaps another. So when the king's carriage is there, there's no, 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 no courtier that, that is in between the, the person looking and the object. And that goes for everything that's on the, on the scroll. The only place that there's something overlapping, we have noticed, are the feet of Yama and Chitragupta. They overlap. That's, that's a minimal thing because he had drawn until oh god there I am no. and it looks clumsy because it's not intended in this type of art this this is a text that was made on demand Kleur said I want to publish on this ceremony and he got this long scroll some explanations were given and they were very carefully written in Kleur gets older and he looks at it and he doesn't understand Chitragupta. He doesn't like the chariot. He doesn't, he doesn't know what to do with it. And so he makes his own copy. And one day he's finished it, he gets a specialist to explain every detail. Hundreds of details and he puts little numbers in it because he doesn't want to, to clutter up. It's for a publication. And the text that we've seen the, the very first in the beginning, with number A, B, C, and it goes on and on and on, is the explanation of the colored one. The colored one is for a European public. He made it. The black and white one, that's the working copy. He has no admiration for Thai art. He likes bodies to be three-dimensional. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't like the king's the king's uh, big clumsy thing and so he takes the one from that was before and leaves them leave all the others out that i think is the explanation of the two scrolls as far as i've come after a year's work but it's not the last word of it but i've i've set my say for as far as i can so that's uh, you know, I, I hope you'll, you'll let me know what you think of it, because I've been thinking, what will the Thais think of this? Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? Any questions or comments on this? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, there's two things I would like to discuss with you. The first one is if you look at today's funerals of the royal family, you will see that they do exactly the same thing. They have this kind of scrolls and they look pretty much the same with these outlines and so on. Not as beautiful, given modern technology, but it, it's, I'm wondering if this maybe started a kind of tradition that is carried on until today. And then um, I would like to put your attention on the urn, if you have the picture from the Dutch urn and the Thai urn. And um, what is, um, was come to my attention is that the t Dutch urn wouldn't be able to function because the, the urn doesn't exist only at the upper part. You also need the lower part in order to function properly. And the Dutch urn has cut out the lower part totally. If, 
Yes. You have another picture where you have to come next to each other, high to the front. So in the, in the urn usually, the, the corpse is in the upper part there, and then you have a an, an lower part. Um, so you would have a lower part here where you have a kind of container to, um, to get all the fluid body fluids out, and that is collected there. And you also have a kind of weight to, to take the weight of the urn. And another thing for the carriot of, of the, the Dutch carriot here, would impossibly be able to actually carry the urn because the urn itself is very heavy. It's made, it's made of teak wood. And today's urn, you need, you need 10 people for, for the smaller urns, not, not the, big, the royal urns, just for the normal smaller urns, you need about 10 people to put them up. Yeah. And um, so actually the newest version are made in Germany. Well, th thank you very much. It's, that's very helpful because I've never carried in the royal urn as yet. I don't think I ever will either, but I've not thought about the weight. But I, it, I've never carried in the royal urn as yet. I don't think I ever will either, but I've not thought about the weight. But I, it is true that the, the, the carriage itself, the real one, um, this one, is a huge, heavy thing. Yes. Yes, you're right there. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> um, could it be a chance that the two elephants are actually real elephants, but there was a fumble on the part of the artist as in he started to draw the sledge and then realized that there, um, it wasn't supposed to draw, but might as well just finish off the whole thing. Yeah, the two elephants at the back. Oh, the two elephants on the back. Yeah, it could be possible that they were actually real elephants, but then when the artist was began to draw it, he like started drawing the, like the sledge like with, like the previous animals, and then like realized. Oh, never mind. Um, the the Dutch guy can't tell the difference. If the, if there were if there were real elephants, the elephants would be on the level of the f people here. Yeah. Can't go back. Yeah, yeah, I can see the theory. In fact, in the very first time I looked at it, in my mind, they were real elephants. But the more I looked at it, the more they couldn't be. And the fact that their, their legs don't seem to be in a moving, well, everything else that is moving, that is real, yeah, you, then you would say he made them so in order to fit in with a sledge. Yeah. yeah. But, there is another thing. In the list of 67 animals that I have got, there are two elephants on the sledges. They're not called the red and the white one, but, but although there is there's some, the colorings are all mentioned. But the lists that I have, I've got three lists. They're not all the same. So it's not a, it's not a rigid list. It's, it's not typical Thai that they, that they vary a bit. You know, but I, there are so many combinations possible in these things. But what would point to you at your direction is that this is not a mixed animal. Well, most of them are mixed, but uh, the elephants in the list are also not mixed. So uh, we would be arguing it forever, I think. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That points for one point for him. He says it, it's not being pulled. True. But how are they going to move? 
Yes, it's very, it's very helpful to me that your views, because uh, I've looked at it so many hours that I've become blind to these things. Eh? Sorry, but if uh, if the artist uh, drew the elephant first and put, hmm, why did he make the elephant so high? Oh, the slit came first. Yes. Uh, oh, and he. Oh. Okay. <laughs> he didn't put room for it to be pulled. Uh, he didn't leave any room for people to be pulled. So I, I think he, he ran out of space on the, on on the scroll. The scroll was, the the scroll was empty first. He put it, the king there, and in his mind he'll have the other things, and then he ran out of space. Because at the end, you can see he's very crowded. I mean, that's not a normal end of a, of a picture. The other end is much more, you can see that that's where he began. He began with the mirror and he ended here. Because this chat, wow, I could just get it in. These people, and these four, they're the crowdiest of all. All the others have room. But I tell you one thing, I didn't realize it until I have talking to you. That really helps. It, other eyes? Is there any indication in Ayutthaya where it is? Mm, I... Uh, I think you know more about that no, than I do. In the document? In the document? No, no. Thank, thanks for a really fascinating talk. Um, one of the most uh, interesting aspects of the scroll for me was those chairs drawn in perspective. I've never seen anything like that in... I'm not an expert in Thai art, but I've never seen anything like that in... in, in um, tie out of that period. I was wondering if you had any explanation for that. Um, it's interesting, it's only that those chairs really are a kind of a, a marginal feature of the whole uh, scroll and is it perhaps something, you know, the artist trying to show off that they know how to draw a European style perspective or is there some other explanation? The, 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 the con contacts uh, between Europeans and Thais were very intensive right throughout the 17th century. So we cannot say they've never seen a chair. No, there, there are real, real um, contacts that, that may have similar true. But it's true that it is an unusual uh, thing and they handle it in a very strange way, as if it, it doesn't fit in with the tradition. That's why, why you know, they, st they stick out. And so I think, um, Possibly because they are making it f for a Dutchman on command. He showed what he could do, but possibly it is for very important uh, monks because a monk can sit high. And so maybe they use, I'll have to look again. I, I've never seen a chair like that anywhere. And with the Baldekins, it's, it's even, even stranger. I've never seen it. So it, it is one of the one of the problems. But that's it's a good good comment. I have two quick questions. One is um, why you think the design around Mount Meru represents a cage. And the other one is, um, how much do we know about acrobats performing at Thai funerals, and how far back does that tradition go? Well, um, I, I didn't. I hope I didn't use the word cage. It's, it is the the difference between the the profane and the sacred. So. Um, With a cage. Oh, the, the cages for the animals. They are mentioned uh, in Quaritch Wells, I think. Quaritch Wells has two chapters on royal funerals uh, in his uh, uh, famous book on, on, on state ceremonies. 
um, two chapters, and I think he says that uh, the animals that are being pulled, he gives, quite a, he gives actually a list of more than 60 of them with the Sanskrit names. It's a very interesting source. And I think he is the one who says they are being brought in and then put in the, in the, in the wall, inner wall of the, of the Mount Meru. That's the first one. You press the middle, the middle between the green. Are you talking about this? Yeah. So what about that indicator? Is it a typical... Oh, no. That's a typical... Like a ratchet. So, so you, you think it's not a cage at all? Well, the, yeah. Well, then they are put behind these things. Somewhere they are, they are, they are housed in this, in this wall. But I, I'll have to avoid using it as cages. No. What's the carriage rail? What's the main lock? I must have a look again. I, must have an, uh, I will look at that again. And the second question was about the, the acrobats. They are, they are um, standard in every royal uh, funeral procession that is being shown. They are mentioned in the in the um, in in the annals also. So they, our, our sources go back to 17th century. I know of nothing older than that. Um, the, the entertainment seems to be standard, and the firework towers seem to be standard too. And they're always the same. The, by the way, for those who are interested in the firework towers, they have a Rahu in it. So if you, if you see the real thing, there, there, is a, there, there is the Rahu eating the moon, always in the firework thing. It's part of the, of the gigantic um, play of, of a cosmic event. So the, the sending off of a king it costs months and months of work, and the building of the, the of the tower that is that costs half a forest in in wood. It is it is an is an unbelievable exercise actually. The Chinese have a very long tradition of acrobats at funerals, going back to the Han Dynasty. So I was just wondering if this is some connection with the. Chinese funerary traditions. Yes, well, here I am really uh, at very thin eyes because, of course, the Chinese uh, sources are t thousand times more uh, bigger and more informative than the Thai sources. We have only got a um, hundred inscriptions, and then we started this time with documents uh, uh, that have survived. So, if there is a link between the Chinese ones and so on, it may not be very old. It may be from the 16th century. See, Thai court traditions are a mixture of Cambodian, Indian, and whatever, whatever came into them. And the links with China are as old as the, as the annals go. So I know the, there's, a regular, there's a regular trade between both, and they've, there's a regular visit to the, to the court. So from the 13th century, Thais visited the courts of, uh, of China. But the Thais didn't, this type of thing is their, their own agglomeration of, their, of what they have learned mainly Cambodian, mainly Cambodian with other influences. And the Cambodian is Indian in its essence. Thank you. It's not about acrobats, although, you know, as you said very correctly, there were all, all sorts of entertainment like uh, Chinese opera and acrobats and uh, Thai drama. But uh, my point is that Ajahn Bas is a great detective, as Chris said. But there's one part of the detective story which still doesn't convince me 100%, which is the colored scroll. I mean, if you hire a Dutchman 
of the well, early 18th century to draw in a quasi-traditional Thai style. Uh, can that person do it? And also, it looks like that person was living in a UTR. Yeah? Uh, or did you think that Kler commissioned it in Amsterdam? <laughs> yeah. uh, the commission in Amsterdam, I, I would think uh, most unlikely because it's Kler who had the, the ABC and so on um, explained by a tie because the explanations in the three-page document, see, this is full of numbers. There are, there are uh, maybe 15 numbers and, 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 and signs all over, all over the scroll. They're everywhere. So this, and the same sign for acrobat is repeated maybe 20 times. These are much more acrobats than there were in the other scroll. So the acrobats, he is quite, uh, comfortable with this is invention. There's nothing there in the in the, in, the, in the Thai scroll, and I have said that you know that the once he's got a face, all faces keep the same. Um, this is three-dimensional. Um, I cannot see it being commissioned in Amsterdam. I cannot see it because the links between the two scrolls are obvious in there. These are the essential bits that he, that the author of the list wants to, to show. That's why he takes a lot of trouble, get all that information from a tie. What it is called, what it is used for, what happens with the ash of the king, it's all written in it. So it's a very interesting document by itself but I have to reserve it for the museum to publish it. Um, and the link between the explanatory document and this scroll is, is absolutely certain. There is no way you can shake that. And the fact that a Dutchman also used the bigger scroll as his own property is because he wrote in Dutch 16 times what it was, but not the real nitty gritty. So I, I, I see the sequence black and white to, to colored as fixed, that they are made locally in Siam is for me absolutely sure. I, I'll, I, I think I can convince you when I give you all the details. I think so. But it's, it, I like to be challenged on it, but I cannot accept that one. Uh, I know the situation in Amsterdam. There was nobody in Amsterdam that knew what that happened to the ashes of the king when it was raked out. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I do not know whether I can express what <laughs> I think, but uh, I have uh, ties of that age, that era, can describe what he saw. Is it the description of what he saw, what's, or, or maybe I, what <laughs> I just get the impression from the professor's story, is, uh, professor's question is, it is something like, it was, even if it was written in Ayutthaya or in Dutchland, it doesn't matter. It was not the des description of the, uh, what the drawer saw, but it was in his head. So, so in this way, uh, it's all some questions. Yes, yes. It's, it's true. We are not dealing with a, with a photographic picture of what was going on during the funeral. It is a simplified, um, the essentials were, were made and they were explained in 15 or 16 uh, terms in Dutch and in, and in, and in Thai, by a Thai. And the fact that a second scroll was made has puzzled me for many months. Um, the first one is already not a depiction of us really because we have a description many pages long by a man who sat in a sala and he saw the whole procession go in front of him. 
That was uh, Captain Roberts in 1833. He sat there and he was bored stiff. He describes 78 soldiers carrying strange things in their right hand. Uh, 84 uh, wailing women, uh, 378 soldiers not carrying anything. So many of this, he just goes on and he sits there for hours and hours and he just counts that all. And then he says, strange animals made from this and that and he asks people what it is made for. It's one of my sources that I like very much because it shows what a European experience when he sit there for hours saying this or, or, and had no idea what was happening or what it meant, what those animals meant and what the, what the big tower meant and he describes also the entertainment at the side and so on. So it is, this is, a, is what Kleur asked somebody to do or what Kleur did himself for the text that he himself had already sent. So he had sent a text about the happenings in court and those happenings were strange and he made them even stranger. And I think the difference between the real cart of carrying an urn and Kleur's version of what carries the urn shows that he just wants the most beautiful thing. He is not interested in what happened actually. He just wants his audience in Europe to say, wow, that is Asia. There they are. Look at those weird animals. Such as I've never seen before. And look at this. And then they look at the, at the three pages of text in which he explains it. Oh, that is called that and that. And there is a Kocha Sea. Oh, Kocha Sea. That's what they call it. It's all weird. He wants to show the weird things. I've looked at many of travel accounts and they're looking for the, the strange things, especially the Dutch. The Dutch were all against these papist rituals, devilish things that are going on, um, idols that are going bow for, horrible things. And those Dutchmen, they come and go. There have been hundreds of Dutchmen who spent their time on a UTI and who never learned a thing. And I think Kleur is one of them. This man knew very little. He knew very little, but he has a nose to make something for the people at home. And so, you know, he managed something. I must say, when I saw the two scrolls for the first time, I first looked at the colored one, because I love a colored scroll. The black and white was not so interesting. That's the first reaction, I think, of anyone. If you see the two scrolls, your eyes go, ah, colors. That's, and it's many colors too. There's, 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 there's all hues. He spent a lot of time at that. And the, the coloring in has been done perfectly. It's fascinating. And I have a question about all the materials. What's the paper? Is it Dutch? Is it Thai? There's no native linen. So linen would have had to be imported. Otherwise, it would be cotton. Is it the same pen? What kind of ink? Um, is analysis being done? You're very right. And that's also what, what I did. So when I saw the, the documents, I had somebody, I had six people lifting parts of the scroll up and we had light underneath to look for, for watermarks. We found watermarks only on the three pages of text which, which was written by Kleur. The three pages of text has a watermark, typical Dutch thing with a, with a crown in Amsterdam, the weapon of Amsterdam, a typical of his time. So, you know, it just gave me pleasure to see that that was a 17th century piece of paper. The, the material was uh, the, the curator of the museum said to me, we have a paper person and we'll send samples to be microscopically looked at. Um, I said to her, the same as, as you now, now say, there is no indigenous 
fine linen in, 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 in Thailand. But there was a fantastic import and export. And so we'll try and find out where it came from. But the fact that an artist at the Utian court could get a piece of linen is not, is not absurd. Um, the fact that a different cloth, a, a rougher, thicker cloth was being used in the Dutch, in, well, in the colored version, just points out that there was a different time when it was being made, in a different place, by a different person. And uh, the differences between the two show that, that this is not Thai, and the other one is. I mean, the artistic work. The, the ink, I'm not sure whether you can analyze much with the ink. The ink is, is typical soot mixed with, with, uh, with oh, you know what the ink is made of? Soot with, with some oil or something. Uh, it's a very ink ec experts, but it's a, was first the, the Dutch one was first drawn in pencil, and then it was it was drawn with a with a pen, and then it was it was coloured in. So there's three even there's still marks of of pencil uh, on the on the scroll that the this this Rajawat, which is much shorter than in the Thai version, is actually much longer, but only in pencil. He never bothered about making that. It's probably too much work because the fit, filling in of the, of the crosses is done meticulously in the Taiwan, but it's a little bit sloppier here. It's, it's the, the fine work is, is not here. I think anybody amongst you will realize that the, the one that I concentrated on and scroll bits for bits is an extremely fine piece of, uh, you know, technically, uh, extremely fine piece of work without a single repair. His pen didn't go off, and, or when he got into trouble, he kept on going. Like when he squeezed up the persons. Um, thank you very much for doing this. This is wonderful. Um, I'm very new to all of this, so please forgive my ignorance. Number one, you, were, you showed the chair and the other sort of something which I'll just comment was to me reminiscent of a canopy bed and the scale was trying to fit into that space. Um, with the colored scroll, I'm wondering, there's a lot of this yellow gold and it seems like ties are, um, have a penchant for that. So I'm wondering, is Mount Maru, was it gold leaf at the time or, or does that make sense? Also, um, Oh, I had one other question. Oh! The, the gold is extraordinary, not in reality. So it wasn't gold leafed or gilded or anything like that? that is, is, is Dutch fantasy. Okay, all right. I didn't know. Okay, and then um, I don't, I'm wondering how recently have they done this ornate, multi day sort of funeral? in Thailand, when's the most recent time? I, I just find it exquisite and hard to imagine. The oldest one that I know of is in the 1620s, I think, uh, where they describe the height of the Meru, but they do not, see, that is for an indigenous, uh, indigenous people. And it, Most recently, I th uh, I think they stopped it in the in the after the 30s. Uh, they stopped it, I think, about before the Second World War. I think they stopped this sort of thing. It's extremely expensive. It costs massive amounts of wood. Uh, um, so Roberts, I know, and the one that uh, I showed for the Prapin Klaus, uh, 1866, it was still done. The best source for this is uh, Quaritch Wales again. He, he gives the last, I think he attended one. Wales actually noted that um, King Rama V had made 
kind of will and said that his funeral should be um, not, not abandoned, but should be cost effective. Yes, yes you're very knowledgeable. Yes, so, so Wales does mention the end of it. Hmm? Oh, I, I just uh, thought that perhaps there's some kind of uh, artistic difference in, in skill. Uh, and maybe the person that Claire uh, prevailed on to, to do a copy, a color copy, was a, a Thai who did not come from a court tradition. Uh, that's possible. And, and a very even more absurd uh, suggestion would be Mr. Claire himself. Yeah, after all, he's called color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I never think of it. Uh, in one of his documents, he actually writes it with a K. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, Claude does mean color. Huh, never thought of that one. Yes, but uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, and the, the last question about the, co the gold color prevailing is for me also, uh, of course, I've seen it, but I hadn't realized how excessive he, d he handles the gold color. Because it, it, there's no use for gold there. There's no use for it. So much gold is not available in, uh, in Thailand to, to waste on a, on, a, on a thing that is only made for one day. Uh, and uh, the seven-day festival is only mentioned in the 17th century, that it lasts seven days for f festivals. But uh, I think the, the most in interesting description for analyzing the, the ritual is quarried wells and state ceremonies, but the most interesting um, personal account of it is Captain Roberts. Uh, you'll be amazed when you find it. And you can see this bored American sitting there and thinking, what am I doing here? Another, another group of 700 soldiers, so oh, cold, you know. <laughs> It's wonderful to read. Yes. Professor, I wonder if we have been able to find out more about the transfer from Holland to Saxonia, uh, how it was found, and uh, perhaps how much was paid for it before it ended up in King August's collection. So um, this is an interesting story. I, I, I spent a lot of time in the archives in Saxony, and uh, that is microfilm work, and it is terrible for your eyes, and you have an unlimited amount of hours, and I worked through his ex expenses, so I know exactly how much he spends every year on what and so on, and I looked for every bit of his collector's mania. He, uh, he wrote in for the expenses where he got his things from and from whom. There is a count an uh, Italian count who worked for him as a general in his private army. And this count got in financial troubles. I think he must have gambled or something. And he went, he was a sort of diplomat count, and he went around collecting for August the Strong by his being, being a count and a general and uh, directly access to King uh, August, uh, he got access to the important houses in, in Europe and he bought for him curtains and te and, and uh, teppich, teppich, what is teppich? Carpets and, and, and furniture and he sent it massive wise to Dresden where it was all duly accounted for and the bill was win it. You know, for so many things, so many hundreds thalers, and for that and that, so many gold, this and that. These went for 200 pieces of gold, I think. These two scrolls in their container. Um, I only found the receipt in the last five minutes of access that I had. It was, it was quite something. I had spent days looking, you know, the whole day. I spent from the opening of the face, and my, my eyes couldn't, couldn't bear it anymore when I suddenly saw two, uh, two paintings, it was. And I looked through, and I saw 
not just that the count had got it, but that the count had got it from, and then he wrote down the name of the director of the Dutch East Indian Company in Amsterdam. So he had collected it from him. And the date is so many years, February or so, in 1716. It arrived there. So Kleur died in 1712. Uh, yeah, 1712 he died. What happens with, with the people's personal belongings and his chattels, they go to Amsterdam. In Amsterdam there is a director. These goods are being, uh, we already call it, auctioned usually, if they are not taken directly. I have no account, I looked for them, I have no way that I see he auctioned it or he took it. I don't know, but the link between the, the scrolls arriving in Amsterdam and ending in, in the possession of one of the directors of the same company, well, I haven't been able to get any further as yet. But if you can, I, I, I think there's no reason not to believe that that uh, the Van der Bemten, that's the name of the director, that he got by it quite legitimately. Nobody would know what it was, but it is a useless thing to have. You cannot display such a thing in your own sitting room. And so he, he when he met his, his friend, the general who was collecting for him, he said, what about your chef? Can't we... You take 50 and I take 150 and off with it. And I think, the, I think he never even looked at it. He must have looked, oh God, no, let it. There's not nothing beautiful you can display in your room. And so it sat there and was forgotten until I got the email. It's an interesting story. So that's how far I've been able to piece it together in one year. I went especially to the archives and looked for other things, but uh, I know quite a bit about this, this, this general who collected things. But uh, a very adventurous man who, who married a, a Dutch woman also in Amsterdam. And he, that was his way of getting into the families with things to sell. He sold lots of Dutch uh, furniture to probably things the Dutchman didn't want anymore. Yeah? Or people who needed money. So that's that story. We'll make it. I think we have to let Bas spend the night before last on an aeroplane. I think we have to let him go to bed now. Uh, we hope we will have this in the next journal of the Siam Society. We hope, including the scroll. We hope. Depends on the museum whether they will let us do it. Please join me in thanking Professor Turwheel for a fabulous.